Um, and uh, thanks, Mark, if you're here, for inviting me to speak. Um, some yeah, yeah, my dad, he does get credit for that. And uh, welcome everybody on Zoom. I'm honored to be up here. And um, you know, like I said, thank you. But uh, then again, a little reservation on that because you asked me to speak for the first time um, during 2020. So um, I'm sure this will all go really smoothly, <laughs> but I can't say that for sure. So we're gonna lean on the Lord for sure on this one. Speaking of 2020, um, let's do a little review of what sort of things have gone on in 2020. We got crazy wildfires. We got a uh, global pandemic, of course, locust swarm straight out of Exodus, um, you know, huge killer bees, um, social unrest, protest. We got, of course, you know, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle dropping off from their, their uh, princely duties. That's, you know, that's a big deal, right? <laughs> Um, oh yeah, by the way, it's an election year and we're all going to go vote in a couple of weeks. So that brings us to our topic this morning, which is unity. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, many of these topics that we're going through right now have people on both sides who feel very strongly one way or another, right? You got for the pandemic, you got you know, no lockdown versus lockdown. You got masks versus no masks. We got Zoom background versus no Zoom background. Mute button versus no mute button in there. <laughs> and in the case of the election, we have, you know, Republicans and Democrats and Trump versus Biden. And these are very uh, important things of course, we should be debating and discussing and talking about it as a society and as a church even. But uh, I don't know about you, this time around, it feels, it feels extra hostile. Um, and even, even in some cases amongst us saints. And so that's why really I wanted to uh, focus in on this idea of unity. We've sort of traded our kindness and gentleness for um, bitterness. We've traded our light that we have for uh, a bit of a darkness, and we've traded our humility for selflessness and uh, conceit. So I didn't really know that the Lord had actually been working this sermon out with me for several months. Um, and it all started, of course, with a Facebook post. Cool. Yeah, so I was having some heated political debate on Facebook and, uh, you know, had made my post and I was all like, yeah, that's right. I said it. I got it. My, my way is the right way, right? And, uh, and then, of course, <clears throat> a little later, you know, my wife Rachel comes up to me and, and she's like, John, you know, that post that you, uh, need I say bravely, came up to me. And she said, I don't think that's really a good representation of your character. Oh. So, and that hits you right there, right? When, when someone that you love tells you something about yourself that is negative, right? But, okay, side note, find yourself someone like that. <laughs> which I did clearly, <laughs> we composed myself. Find someone like that <laughs> and keep them and listen to them. Um, so anyway, after a little while of, you know, fighting myself and inside, uh, you know, I realized that she was right, totally right. And um, I realized that I had to do some changing of myself. So my prayer for me, my prayer for the church, is that we soften, we soften a bit, that we lift our eyes to, to Christ, um, who is the example of, uh, of and how we should be treating one another. Um, so uh, speaking of prayer, let's go ahead and do that. Dear Father, uh, I just thank you so much for your son who uh, gave himself for us, the greatest gift of all. And um, I just pray that we have, we uh, this time together that we have will be for you, 
and um, in your name, amen. So then what do we do as Christians then to stay unified during these very divisive times? Well, it starts back to what I was asking myself in that Facebook post, right? After that Facebook post, <laughs> um, you know, can I change? Am I malleable? Am I, um, am I, am I, st or am I just stuck in my ways? And I think this is applicable for anybody, but the older we get, I feel like that, that tendency, we start getting sort of stuck in the ways of this world, I would guess. But so the Lord brought me to Isaiah 64, eight, but now, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. So I started, you know, asking myself and asking others even, you know, am I somebody who is, you know, that the Lord can, can really mold me? Or am I just that, that just picture that clay pot that you buy at Home Depot for your cute plant and you try to, it, it would just break if you put any pressure on it. Just those pots are not strong at all. So that led me to think of basically coming down to my two points of this message, which is, you know, what, what, what things do I need to change in me? Um, it's first, we have to change our priorities. We're changing our focus from ourselves to Christ and to then from earthly things to heavenly, which is Christ's kingdom. So that's number one. Second, we need to change our hearts from uh, hearts of selfishness to hearts of humility. Again, with Christ as our example. So that's it, hearts, priorities. We gotta change our hearts, our priorities. Got it, got it? Yeah, good, good. Okay, we're done here, we're good. As uh, John Ayamo would say, let's go eat some sauce. Just kidding, just kidding. Uh, uh, we have two kids at home. We're not making any sauce. It's not, <laughs> it's not happening. I would love to make my grandpa's sauce, but not happening. But let's uh, dig maybe into God's word here and look that we can just back up some of these thoughts here. Remember, our priorities and our hearts. Okay, so let's open quickly to Philippians will be our main passage for the day. So we'll start in Philippians 1. So as you're turning there, I'll do a quick background of Philippians here for you guys. Um, Paul and Timothy helped start the church in Philippi on his uh, one of his many missions trips. And um, he's thanking them through this book for their financial support and their prayer of his ministry. And it's a really a, a, one of his most personal um, epistles, prison epistles. He's, he's writing this from, the, from prison. And it's a great piece of uh, encouragement to the church there, as well as us now. Um, as well as he touches on some specific issues that they're dealing with, including, uh, of course, disunity and rivalry. So um, we're going to go ahead and look at that. So point number one, we're going to change our perspective to Christ and his kingdom, and that will help us be united as a church. And um, as we're thinking about it, it's like we're caught up today in, in today's age. We're caught up with everything around us. And sometimes we need this sort of little reminder. Um, and I was thinking about it in the first meeting that that's, and it wasn't in my notes, but the Lord led me to think that first meeting is just one more practical example of ways we can be changing from our hearts to looking at Christ. Um, so let's read. Philippians 1, 20, we're going to look at 20 to 23. According to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that I, but with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death, for me to, li to live is Christ and to die is gain. But I am to live on in the flesh. But if, sorry, but if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which I choose, but I'm hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to, to depart and be with Christ for that is very much better. 
Okay, so, I mean, Paul's circumstances here are pretty bleak um, when, you, when you think about it. He's in prison uh, being persecuted for his faith. Um, and his, and when we're reading here, we see that his, he's struggling between either pressing on for Christ in living or to just, you know, die and be with Christ. So his, his perspective is either, oh, I'm going to live for Christ or I'm going to die and be with Christ. So his perspective is laser focused on one thing, and that is Christ. And that's the point that I want to really point out today is, is um, his focus on Christ. Paul's good example here, which is quite impressive because Rachel can attest in, in our present life situation, my laser focus might look something like this, okay? Just got the baby down, okay? Baby's down, Layla's playing. She's old enough now that it's like she can hang out by herself for five minutes. So we get to do two things. At one, do I go take a shower because I stink? Mind you, this is 1 p.m. now, 2 p.m. maybe. Or two, do I eat some food so I can, you know, make it through the day and have energy? Um, so again, we're, we're, we're distracted in our life right now by so many different things. Not all of them are bad things, but there's so many things going on, especially in today's days and age with, you know, electronics and phones and, and whatever it may be. There, these things are popping up notifications nonstop and uh, distracting us from what may the Lord might be wanting to do for us. If our focus isn't on him, we might be distracted and just go by the wayside there. So let's continue to think about here. We're looking at that famous verse, uh, verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And uh, I thought it was interesting uh, considering our political uh, atmosphere here. Um, it's not for me to live is Trump, to live is Biden. No, no, no. That's our total wrong sphere. Are we thinking nonstop about politics then our, our focus is wrong. Our focus is wrong. It's to me to live is Christ and that will determine then where we do with our lives. So let's continue reading here in our verses 24 to 30. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for the progress and joy in the faith so that uh, your, your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come, sorry, whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are, here we go, standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. I'm going to stop there. Paul's goal here, if he is to stay alive, which he decides that's what he, the Lord wants him to do. If he's going to do that, his goal is here to help unite the church around the gospel of Christ. And that just practically um, speaking, that just made me think, if that is my goal, if our goal is to strive together, be of one mind. That means when I'm, when I'm having a discussion, you know, I'm debating, if, I'm, if I disagree with somebody about something, how does that work? That means that if, if this is at the top of my, my attitude towards them will change, right? My demeanor, my whole, my whole tone should change because my goal isn't to get my side to be the right one. It is to come to a unified decision, a unified consensus about something. And it, and it pulls the selfishness out of it because we're focused on Christ's gospel. Okay, so th that's the first part of this focus shift, this per perspective shift is that we're changing our minds. We're using Paul's example here to be on Christ instead of ourselves. The second part is we're shifting our perspective from earthly things to Christ's kingdom. So let's, can, let's move up here into Philippians 3. We're gonna read 18 through 21. Sorry. 
starting in verse 18. For many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite and whose glory is their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. All right, we'll stop there for a second. Last week, uh, um, Sid has, well, how do you say his name? Has, husband, yeah. He, he, he had a good point about earthly things that, that made me think about this. Where is our source of information? Where are we getting it? Is it from the news? Is it from social media? Um, which, which these things aren't inherently bad in themselves, but they all have their own spin. They all have their own motive. And it's generally an earthly motive. It's, and, and, and they tend to drive us, drive a wedge between us um, and push us out into our own separate little bubbles, it, may, it might feel, uh, and make you sort of pick a side, make you pick a side. Okay, I'm going to stamp this side, this, this side or this side. Or are we getting our information from God's word that is encouraging us to stand firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel? So let's continue to, to read here. Um, verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with, with the body of his glory by exertion of the power that he has even to sub, subject all things to him. So we see that um, even though, yeah, we are, we are citizens of the United States, we are citizens of Canada, we are citizens of whatever country you're from, um, we can all be united as believers that we are part of this everlasting uh, citizenship, which is in heaven. And this actually reminds me of a, uh, a um, illustration, which I don't have rope. <laughs> it's supposed to be a visual illustration, but I guess I'll be the visual. Everybody knows this one with of the, the really long rope, and it's really long, and there's a little piece that's about an inch long, and it's red piece of red tape. I think I saw this at camp when I was like five. And uh, and that represent, represents our, our life. And I, and I thought about right now is like, you know, a sliver, sliver of that piece of that. And, and yet we are so, we're super focused, right? We're laser focused on that tiny little sliver. <laughs> but uh, then the rest of this rope, right? It's gonna go, whoa, whoa, over there. It's like 20 feet long and that's eternity. That's our, that's our citizenship, right? Is eternity with Christ and his kingdom. And yet we're, we're so focused on these little things in our life now that we lose focus on what the future is to hold. So let's dig a little bit more deeper into this thought and see how this can help you um, unite us here. So turn with me to Ephesians, Ephesians 2. We're going to start getting into that gospel real quick. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of the flesh, indulging the desires of flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. All right, I guess we'll stop there for a second. So verse two, formerly walked according to the course of the world. Our cares and worries were only of what's happening now. What's uh, the cares of our flesh and our mind. And uh, which is interesting because it says that we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. And this uh, piqued my interest because we're united in that. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sullen fact to know, but we are united in the fact that we are all, you know, um, dead in our trespasses together. But we are all made alive together with Christ in uh, verse 5 there, which is a beautiful thing. And, but not only that, not only were we made alive, but then we were raised up. I don't, I don't think I kept reading. Okay. 
from verse four. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, yes, so he raised us again. This is this idea of he's raised us back into the heavenlies. We are not just going to be staying here on earth forever. And um, so when we, in a couple weeks, when we go to that ballot box, right, let's just be reminded again that our main focus should not be on who's going to be in the Oval Office, but rather who is going to be who is on the throne. Okay, so that is the our. So we've changed our focus now from Christ, and not from Christ. We change it from ourselves to Christ, and from earthly things to His kingdom. All right. So that's our perspective shift. Um, now let's now that we've sort of done that. Let's continue to use Christ as this example for the next point of how we can change our hearts. So back to our main passage in Philippians. Having you turn all over the place, but that's what the Bible's for. Maybe I should do a sword drill. There you go. Yeah. <coughs> We're gonna no electronics allowed. No electronics allowed. No, that's cheating. So half of you don't, you're not gonna make it. No, <laughs> All right, let's read uh, chapter two now, verse one and two. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the spirit, if any affection and compassion, I can't make my voice go any higher than that, actually. <laughs> make my joy complete by being in the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in, in spirit, intent on one purpose. So again, we see right off the bat, what's Paul's goal? He wants us to be united. He wants us to be of the same mind, same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. This is our goal. And we just, you know, read earlier, standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. He's just hammering this away at, this, at the church of Philippi. Um, okay, let's continue. So how do we do that, though? <clears throat> get back in my notes here. Okay, so let's read verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish, um, selfishness <clears throat> or conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interest of others. Excuse me, need water. <clears throat> okay. So um, the whole changing focus, right? It, it, it's not too hard, okay? We get distracted. Now let's focus back on Christ. Let's uh, focus on his kingdom. Okay, we got that. Okay, this part to me was the part that it has taken a little bit of a struggle, if I, I may say it. I feel more rigid. <clears throat> I can feel my flesh sort of fighting back. What does it mean to not merely look for your own and personal interests, but also for the interests of others? Well, uh, it means that instead of sending a snarky Facebook post like I did, you send them a note of encouragement. It means instead of watching your favorite show after a long day of work, maybe you go help at Awana or um, Monday meal drive. It means giving up a lazy Saturday to maybe go help somebody move. Um, you know, it means uh, again, instead of buying that new fancy electronic you've been wanting for a while, you give the money to somebody in need instead. And uh, no, this isn't basically a list of the exact things I should be doing right now <laughs> or anything. <laughs> We are essentially changing, we're, we're giving up something of our own that we dearly care about for somebody else in return. Which this, I guess, is a good example because that note that was read in the first service um, was a really powerful example of this, I believe, because 
the uh, Monday meal service that has been going on, somebody had sent a really kind note that basically said, thank you for the encouragement and the, essentially the light that you're providing to the community and to, to me. And, it, and that's again, this example of this unity that we have as a church when we are sharing and caring together. Okay, so let's continue t- um, in our passage here, Philippians 2. We're going to read 5 through 11. Now, this section here is often referred to as the kenosis or the emptying of Christ. So let's go ahead and read it. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above all names, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. So this is where we look to Christ as our example of changing our hearts from this selfless selfishness to humility. It's hard. It's hard to change and, um, and to let God mold us. But, but, but Christ is the best example of this. And this is also the gospel that uh, Paul keeps referring to back. He says back in verse 27 of 1. Standing firm in one, or yep, standing in one spirit, the faith of the gospel. Um, so let's read a little bit more about that gospel. And we, we read it this morning, actually, in Romans 5, 8, and 9. I'll just read it for you. Um, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved through the wrath of God, through him. And also in Ephesians, let's go back to that passage from Ephesians 2. We'll finish that passage we were reading earlier, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to walk in them. So we are united together. We can be united together around this goal that the gospel of Christ will be told everywhere and to everyone. And if you haven't put your faith in the Lord today, there's no better time to do that than now. And there's elders here. If you are here, or if, if you're on Zoom, I'm sure you could message somebody if you have questions about Um, becoming a follower of Jesus, you could do it today. Because that is the goal that we have. So Christ came, he he was, um, where are we here? Christ, who is all powerful, who is uh, perfectly united with God. He became a man, humbled himself and died for us. He did this for me. He did this for you. He did this for your family member who has totally different political opinions than you do. And, um, you know, there's a great graphic going around right now, um, sort of a good visual for um, what I'm talking about, specifically in the uh, political realm. It says, Kamala is beloved. Donald is fearfully and wonderfully made. Mike is cherished. And Joe is important enough that I died for him. And it's signed, Jesus Christ. Why, when I first read that, why did it feel a bit controversial? It felt, it hit me a little bit like, uh, I don't know if I agree with that a little bit. Like, well, I don't know if that per- I like that person or, right? Like, it's just something about it. You're like, oh, I don't know. Well, it's because we've replaced God's word with man's word. And we've been listening to people basically like putting down each other 
and t making us believe that we need to believe that way about this person or that person. And that's not what the Lord wants. That's not what he desires of these people. So if we can, again, change our perspective in our hearts to, um, to look at each other as beloved and cherished by Jesus, if, if, if we could change that perspective, I think that it would bring us closer to unity. And let's, again, be a reflection of Christ's unity. So lastly, our eyes are now on Christ. Our hearts are reflective of his humility. And this will help guide us, guide our actions towards unity and being a light in this world. So let's continue. Just a couple more verses here um, in, our, in Philippians. We're going to do 12 um, through 18. We'll just read it. So this final portion of scripture is just a charge to them as well as an encouragement. Read 12 and 13. So then my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is, work, who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This verse, um, I think what Paul's trying to tell the church at Philippi is they're, they're having some disputes with each other. and He wants them to work them out, right? He wants them to keep at it and don't give up on these things. And what this verse hit me was um, this change, right? Like if, if the Lord wants to change me, I'm so rigid against him. But I need to work through that. It's not going to be easy for us to change our hearts. It's not going to be easy for us to change our minds. But the Lord wants us to work through it with fear and trembling. It means that anything that's really good to work for might take some effort. Verse 13, we see that God is at work in you. And this reminded me of the clay, that he is molding us. If we let him, he will mold us and help us change our hearts. So let's read 14 and 15 here. And yes. Do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God among above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear the light of the world. So as we see again, we're seeing a little bit of a contrast between earthly things and heavenly things, right? He wants us to be blameless and innocent during this, in this, this earth that's very, as he says, crooked and perverse. So as we um, let God change us and unite the church, we then, during these really dark times, we can be the light. And let's finish off here, 16 through 18. Yeah, 16, yeah. Holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I will have good... Uh, have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. So we say, he's saying, hold fast to the word of life. You know, of course, that's another encouragement for us to go back to our word as our form, our means of information. And, uh, and then he, he goes into sort of a little bit of an encouragement. Um, even though we are being poured out, we're, we are working for the Lord and it's not going to be easy. He says to rejoice, which is again, a great um, change of mind here. I urge you rejoice in the same way and share in your joy with me. So I think part of being united is something that we share together you know, this love that we found in Christ. So in conclusion, so I did a little bit more detail, but two things, right? Change our priorities, changing our focus from ourselves to Christ and his kingdom. And then second, we need to change our hearts. We need to be able to be molded and not be really hard. I mean, from hearts of selfishness, two hearts of humility with Christ as our example. Let's go ahead and just pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for leading this message. I pray that 
um, in myself that I can soften so that um, you may do a good work through me and, uh, and just pray for the church as well as a whole that we can stay united during these times of, of division. Um, 2020 has been a year that's very difficult, but it's just one sliver in this eternal time. Let us have our focus be shifted again to you and your kingdom that we uh, that is everlasting. So again, thank you for your son and uh, pray for this church and our, the rest of the time that we have together. In your name, amen. Thank you, everybody on Zoom. <laughs>